Welcome to today's webinar titled, A Children's Guide to Coping with Disasters. We are thrilled to have Rebecca May with us today. Rebecca is currently a clinical call center manager for Military One Source and has worked with the program for eight years. She is a licensed professional counselor with a master's degree in counseling psychology from Loyola University. She has also worked as a child therapist and with the, Net and with the New Hampshire Disaster Behavior Health Response Team. Without further delay, I will turn things over to Rebecca May. Thank you, Stan, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to a guide to helping children cope with disasters. First, I'll need to read to you a disclaimer, and that is that the appearance of hyperlinks does not constitute endorsement by the Department of Defense of this website or the information, products, or services contained therein. For other than authorized activities, such as military exchanges and morale, welfare, and recreation sites, the Department of Defense does not exercise any editorial control over the information you may find at these locations. Such links are provided consistent with the stated purpose of the Department of Defense sponsored webinar. What will you learn today? Our two main areas of focus today are how disasters can affect children and what you can do to help children cope with disasters. The agenda for today is to speak about what a disaster is relative to the topic at hand, talk about how disasters affect children and what to look for, and also what you can do to help children help cope with disasters. At the end, we will summarize what we have talked about, and then there will be opportunity for people to ask questions. I'd like to start off with a quick poll. Okay, I will launch the poll. The first poll reads, are you attending as a service member, spouse, or provider? I'll give you a few minutes to answer, a few seconds to answer. Okay, it looks like we have about 50% um, service members and 50% uh, providers. Great, thank you. So what is a disaster? A disaster is an event that happens suddenly and causes much suffering or loss to many people. Experiencing a natural disaster can be frightening for adults and can be especially traumatic for children and youth. The entire community may be affected, impacting a child's sense of normalcy and stability. There are many kinds of natural disasters, and some are more predictable than others. Due to the mass destruction that tornadoes can bring in a short period of time, survivor guilt is something that may be seen more after this type of disaster. A child may feel guilty that they still have a house to live in, while their friend next door does not. Although hurricanes can be predicted days to weeks in advance, giving time to prepare, the preparation activities in themselves may generate fear and anxiety. Floods are one of the most common types of disasters. When dams fail, it can be particularly destructive. Residents may have to wait days or weeks before they can even begin to clean up. Earthquakes occur with virtually no warning, so there is no time to mentally prepare for the event. Aftershocks of earthquakes may increase psychological distress since there is no defined endpoint. This training speaks mostly to natural disasters, but many of the principles you will learn here also apply to man-made disasters. If you would take a moment to think about and remember the Fort Hood shooting in 2009. This shooting caused more casualties than any other American military base. Even further back, think about the Columbine High School shooting. With these events, children were either directly or indirectly involved and were definitely impacted. Simply seeing news footage of a shooting nearby 
or learning that a friend or family member was involved can be enough for a child to raise questions and have a variety of emotions. This can certainly also be true when a parent is deployed and there is news footage of the war. How can a disaster affect children? In disasters, sometimes houses, schools, and other buildings are damaged. A child may have lost their home and belongings and have to live in a temporary location. They may feel out of place, uncomfortable, and frustrated. They may also have to go to school or daycare in a temporary location as well. Although disasters may only last a short period of time, People can be impacted by the aftermath of a disaster for months or even years. Collaboration between many organizations is required to assist survivors of a disaster. Families are often required to deal with several people and agencies, such as insurance adjusters, roofers, electricians, contractors, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency more commonly known as FEMA. I'd like to do another poll right now. Okay, I will launch our second poll. The poll reads, have you experienced, first option, a natural disaster, hurricane, flood, earthquake, another type of disaster, school shooting, base shooting, or none of the above? Give you a few seconds to make your choice. And Rebecca, it looks like we have a hundred percent have experienced a natural disaster, hurricane, flood, or earthquake. Wow! So all of our audience participants today have experienced some type of disaster. The next poll. I'd like to do um, involves working with children or having children of your own. Okay, our next poll. Reads, do you, and you may choose all that apply, have one or more children, um, the second option, with children, none of the above. Take a few seconds to make your choice or choices. Rebecca, it looks like we have 50% um, have one or more children, and the other 50% uh, works with children. Great. Thank you. So this really just reinforces um, how, how appropriate this topic is for our audience and how disasters affect all of us. And um, all of us currently attending either have children or currently work with children. Thank you. Natural disasters, as well as man-made disasters, such as a shooting, can leave a child feeling frightened without completely understanding what has happened. The severity of children's reactions will depend on different factors, including exposure to the actual event, the level of physical destruction, personal injury or loss of a loved one, as well as pre-existing risk factors such as a mental illness and exposure to a previous traumatic experience. In preschoolers, you may notice irritability, crying more often than usual, acting out parts of the event or disaster through play, difficulty sleeping and nightmares, Regressive behaviors such as thumb sucking, bedwetting, clinging to parents, things they did when they were younger, or even a lack of emotional expression. Although school aged children have a more advanced understanding of the world around them, they are also subject to post disaster stress that can manifest itself in several ways. This includes preoccupation with the event, withdrawal from friends and family as well as activities they used to enjoy, headaches or nausea, sleep problems, difficulty concentrating in school, 
depression, aggression, guilt over what has happened, risk-taking behaviors, or fear of leaving home. They may also fear going to school, in particular in cases where the disaster occurred while they were in school. When I worked with children who had witnessed domestic violence in their homes, there was a seven-year-old boy. He came in for individual and group therapy. Information that we received from the child's mother was that the school had determined that he had a diagnosis of ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. During a staff meeting, we had a discussion around if this was actually an accurate diagnosis or not, given that the child was repeatedly exposed to traumatic events via his father assaulting his mother in the home. Did he really have ADHD or was the inattention and hyperactivity simply a normal reaction to the chaos that he was exposed to. It is important when working with children to consider what they have been exposed to in their environment and how those environmental factors might be manifesting themselves in the form of maladaptive behaviors. Because adolescents are already going through a lot of physical and emotional changes due to their developmental stage, <clears throat> it may be even more difficult for them to cope with the trauma. Older teens may act as though the trauma has not impacted them at all and deny their reactions to themselves and their caregivers. Denial or inability to identify emotions can manifest in the form of physical aches and pains. Some adolescents may become more argumentative at home or in school, while others may engage in risky behaviors such as drug and alcohol use. So what do children need to know from you as a parent, as a provider? Children need to know that they are not alone. Reassure them that you are there to protect them. Provide extra physical reassurance. For parents, things like extra hugging and staying longer at bedtime to read a book can help with the child's sense of safety. Giving them a comforting toy or something of yours to keep, such as a handkerchief or photograph from you, can be helpful. Let the child know that eventually things will return to normal. If their routine has been interrupted, let them know that it is only temporary and try to get back to a normal routine as soon as possible. However, avoid making promises that you may not be able to keep, such as, this will never happen again. Validating their feelings is very important. Avoid saying things like, don't cry or don't be sad. Let them know that their feelings are normal and okay. It's even okay for children to express negative feelings such as anger. Allowing them to express those feelings can prevent them from acting out in other ways. Focus on their strengths and resiliency. You can talk with the child about how they have handled difficult situations in the past and encourage them to utilize those same coping skills. What did they do in the past when they were scared or upset? Reminding them how they have handled problems before can empower children. Also, be aware of your own reactions. It's okay for children to see adults crying, but try not to show intense emotions like screaming, kicking furniture, or punching walls. This can be scary for children. When discussing the event with other adults, watch what you say in the presence of children that may be disturbing to them. Children need adults to be a calm, in-control presence during stressful times. Earlier we talked about, we did a poll um, to see how many people were impacted by a disaster. I'd like you to think about how you've coped with that disaster or traumatic event. As adults raising or working with children, it's important that we role model healthy coping skills for children. Practice self-care, set routines, eat healthy, get enough sleep, exercise, and take deep breaths when things get stressful. Take care of your own needs. 
you will be better able to help a child if you are coping well. If you need additional support for yourself, talk to other adults such as friends, family, a chaplain, or a counselor to help you develop positive coping skills. More about what you can do to help children cope. Talk with children about their support system and encourage them to use it. Be available as much as you can to talk and comfort with the, to talk with and comfort the child. Patience and understanding are extremely helpful after a trauma. Peer relationships decrease isolation and can provide suggestions for how to cope. Parents, teachers, and other caregivers can help children express their emotions by talking to them or allowing them to express themselves via other modes of communication, such as writing, drawing, and singing. Younger children may need to express themselves through play. If the child is hesitant to talk, ask them to draw pictures about what happened and talk with them about the pictures. They can also act out their feelings with toys or puppets. Use play acting to communicate about the disaster. Don't be alarmed if the child expresses angry or violent emotions. Again, validation of feelings is a key here. Allow them to ask questions. Ask them open-ended questions and pay attention to what they say and their body language when they respond. Ask the child, what do they think has happened? This way, misconceptions can be cleared up. Sometimes, when children don't understand things, they think it's their fault. Also, try to be patient if the child asks the same question many times. Depending on their developmental stage, when children don't completely understand things, again, they blame themselves. As part of a bereavement group I was leading with children who had lost a parent, I did a quick poll to see who thought the death of their parent was their fault. Unanimously, the whole group raised their hands. This is a chilling discovery for me. But I was glad I asked the question because it allowed the group members to process and realize that it was not, in fact, their fault. Be aware that children may think the disaster is their fault and ensure them that it is not. When children are asking the same question time after time, it's important to stay patient. Sometimes they find the repetitiveness actually soothing. For teenagers, it can be helpful to share their concerns and how you responded to them with other family members. If everyone is delivering the same kind of information, it will help to give a consistent message. Remember, however, if the teen shares something to you in confidence, not to share that specific information. Trust is really key with teenagers. Um, it's important at any age, but particularly can be fragile with teenagers. You might suggest that a teenager keep a journal or become involved in the disaster recovery in some way. It can help bring a sense of hope and control over the situation. It's also okay to temporarily lower your expectations of school and home responsibilities. It's normal for their attention to be focused elsewhere at this time and should resume after days or weeks. You can help children cope with man-made disasters such as a war or a base or school shooting in similar ways. As a caring adult, your first instinct is likely to comfort the children in your life. If you find yourself having difficulty communicating or want the assistance of a professional, there are counseling options, such as child and youth, behavioral, military, and family life counselors, or a provider through Military OneSource. In addition to validating feelings, allowing children to express their emotions, practicing good self-care, and maintaining routines as much as possible, it's also good to help them keep busy by spending time, time with friends or helping others. For preschool children, 
It's helpful to crouch down to their level and speak in a calm, gentle voice. Use words they can understand. Take a deep breath before picking them up and holding them in order to focus on them and not the trauma. Be careful not to pressure children to talk about trauma or join in expressive activities. Allow them to remove, remove themselves from these activities if they become uncomfortable. And last, avoid allowing them to be repeatedly exposed to the disaster via television, social media, etc. If we think back to 9-11, how devastating that was for our country, and how many times most of us repeatedly saw those images on television. That can be re-traumatizing for children and adults alike, in particular those in close proximity to the disaster and those who lost a loved one in the disaster. In summary, remind children they are not alone. Things will get back to normal. They can find positive ways to express their feelings. They should be sure to ask parents, teachers, and other trusted adults for help if they are feeling sad, angry, or scared. And that they can have lots of different feelings at the same time. Some articles around this topic that you can find on the www.militaryonesource.nil website include Helping Young Children Cope After a Natural Disaster, Helping Your Teenager Cope After a Natural Disaster, Helping a, a Child Manage Fears After a Traumatic Event, Helping School-Age Kids Get, quote, Back to Normal After a Shooting, and recognizing the signs of stress in children after a disaster. In addition, we have several materials that are available. Um, some that I'm, that I'm recommending currently um, is Trevor Romaine's Memory Box Grief Comfort Kit. Trevor Romaine is a best-selling author and illustrator as well as motivational speaker. If a child has lost a loved one during a disaster, we have this memory box and grief comfort kit for children, which includes a special memory box for keepsakes, a stuffed animal for comfort, a Parents' Choice Gold Award winning DVD called What on Earth Do You Do When Someone Dies, as well as a booklet for caregivers. If a young child has lost a parent, we have a DVD called Sesame Streets When Families Grieve. This bilingual resource kit is geared toward children ages 2 to 5 and includes a DVD featuring Elmo and other Sesame Street characters. It includes the stories of families who have experienced the death of a parent, a child's storybook, and a guide for parents and caregivers to help support children coping with the death of a parent. And last, we have a booklet called Honoring Our Babies and Toddlers. Supporting Young Children Affected by a Military Parent's Death. This booklet explores the issues of stress, trauma, grief, and loss as it relates to a military parent's death. Okay, now I'd like to open it up and see if anyone has any questions. I'll also um, put some screens up there with additional resources while we ask questions. Thank you, Rebecca. We do have um, several questions that will come in. And uh, the first question reads, what are some organizations that specialize in helping children cope with a disaster? Organizations that um, specialize in helping children cope with a disaster, there are several organizations out there. Um, we have a couple of uh, national organizations, and those would be um, the Red Cross as well as FEMA. In addition, uh, many states have their own organizations that respond to disasters and can assist with children um, coping with a disaster. For example, when I lived and worked in New Hampshire, I participated in the New Hampshire Disaster Behavioral Health Response Team. 
and as a counselor in New Hampshire, I um, worked with victims of floods and also worked with children who were um, who had parents in the National Guard and were expecting their parent to return uh, from deployment. So you can check with your, your local uh, resources as well to find a similar state organization. Okay, thank you. Next question reads, what are some tips for parents or caregivers with special needs kids during or after a disaster? Okay, so special needs children, um, tips for coping with the disaster. You know, that's a tough question because it really depends on the type of special need that the child has. So you might um, treat a child very differently who has autism and is experiencing a disaster versus a child who has cerebral palsy. Both would need different interventions, different resources, and things like that. But if you're looking um, to specifically, you know, help a particular child, there are a couple of resources that I would recommend, and that would be On Base, the Exceptional Family Member Program, has a wealth of resources. And in addition, Military One Source has a special needs consultation um, with Military One Source um, triage consultants who specialize in the area of children with special needs. And um, you can get free one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions with with that type of provider as well. Okay, thanks. Um, next question. How do I know when a child is having a normal reaction to a disaster versus something that requires additional help? Okay, another great question. It's important to think about how the child has reacted previously to events that were disturbing to them. Um, think about are they exhibiting behaviors that are way out of the norm for them? Uh, if so, it can be helpful to take them to a counselor that specializes in working with children. Um, this could be a, a military family life counselor or for children 13 and up, a military one source provider. Or you could go through insurance such, a, such as you know, TRICARE, private insurance, or other community resources. And if you're not sure where to go, um, you can always give us a call at Military One Source and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. Okay, great. Um, our last question reads, if the whole family is impacted, is individual counseling for the child more appropriate or should we see a counselor as a family? If the whole family is impacted, it can be helpful to see a counselor as a family. The family can talk together about how the disaster has impacted them, um, discuss coping skills, as well as how they can support one another. Uh, getting through tough times like this can really bring a family closer. Again, family therapy um, can be accessed through Military One Source for children of all ages, via a military and family life counselor, TRICARE, private insurance, or other community resources. Okay, great. Um, at this time, I don't see that we have any more questions that have come in, so I would like to thank our presenter, Rebecca May, for sharing her invaluable experience and expertise. I would also like to thank our attendees for participating in today's webinar. And if you find yourself having questions after the webinar is over, please email moswebinars at militaryonesource.com, and I'll get your questions over to our presenter for an answer. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us, and this concludes our webinar on A Children's Guide to Coping with Disasters.